Great. Hello, chemistry students. This is Professor Sean McMahon with Chapter 8, Gases. So in our last chapter, Chapter 7, we covered intermolecular forces which were dependent on the shapes of molecules and whether or not they were polar, nonpolar. And the reason why those intermolecular forces were so important, we discussed how they pretty much decide whether or not the molecules or particles are sticking to one another. And we had referred to solids and liquids as condensed phases. That's where the battle between kinetic energy and intermolecular forces, the intermolecular forces kind of win that battle. Well, now we're gonna be dealing with gases and gas laws, where these tend to be particles that have very weak intermolecular forces. So there's not a lot of sticking, primarily only London dispersion forces. That's why they don't have strong intermolecular forces. And as a result, because they don't stick, they have high kinetic energy, which leads us to a concept of kinetic molecular theory that we see in gases. So we'll be discussing all this in this chapter. And in this first section, we're gonna focus on the basic gas laws, okay? One of the things I wanna mention is it's gonna seem a little overwhelming because there's quite a few gas laws. You will see, I'm going through a progression of ideas, but basically all the gas laws in today's lecture can be derived from one equation. That will be the second lecture of chapter eight, PV equals NRT. P stands for pressure, V stands for volume, N stands for moles, R is a constant, and T is temperature. So if we rearrange this, to this equation, the ideal gas law equation, PV equals NRT, to solve for R, a constant, we will get this ratio, PV over NT equals a constant. We can manipulate that ratio, that quotient right here, to determine all these basic laws. But we have to first talk about each of the parameters of gases, pressure, volume, moles, and temperature, so that we can first derive this historically and have a better understanding. So enough of that, let's just go straight into it. Gases are a unique phase, right? And nearly all of their properties are independent of what they are. So that is unique, typically, you know, the chemical identity of the substance is gonna influence whether it has strong surface tension or uh, a high boiling point. What gas is, they're kind of independent with that, okay? So gas behavior is different than, again, the condensed phases of solids and liquids. We're gonna look at the theory that explains why gas behavior is universal, and then we're gonna talk about the calculations. So first, the theory, that I first was talking about is kinetic molecular theory. So in a simple model for understanding behavior of gases, we use the following assumptions. Gas consists of small particles that are moving randomly at high velocity. So you have gas particles moving in straight lines and very high velocities. Now we don't necessarily feel them colliding on us because they're so small, okay? but they are colliding. Two, they essentially have no attractive forces. So you can think of it as when they collide, they just bounce off each other. It's referred to as an elastic collision. Elastic because they just bounce off each other and they don't stick. You can think of those little things on desks where, I forget the name of it, where students or someone will just take a ball and it'll hit one and it'll cause it to go back and forth. It's kind of the same concept, okay? These are just gonna bounce off each other. They have a very small volume compared to the vo volume of the container that, that occupies them. So the majority of a gas is empty space. And we can see if this was my container, the majority is not due to the size of the actual particle, it's empty space. And that is why we are able to compress gases. Okay, and you see this when you see gas tanks, let's say for helium balloons, you have a really small cylinder, but you could release the pressure gauge and allow the gases to expand into balloons and fill a much larger volume, okay? The other thing is they're constantly moving, and that we'll see is in relation to a pressure that they will exert. They have kinetic energies, and when we heat gases up, 
because temperature is directly proportional to kinetic energy, these particles are going to be moving faster. And when they move faster, they exert greater pressures because they have greater kinetic energy. So again, what are the four properties that we're going to use in our basic gas laws to describe gases? One is pressure. I'll talk a little more about this in a moment, but it's basically the force exerted by a gas against the walls of its container, okay? Volume is a space that they occupied. That makes a little more sense. Temperature, that's the factor that determines the kinetic energy. It's a kind of related to its average kinetic energy and the motion of the particles, right? So if you increase temperature, they're gonna move faster. And the amount of gas, lowercase n. Now, I know that one's maybe a little odd for a variable n for moles, but that's what they use for gas laws. And that's basically the number of particles in the container. So the one that's the most difficult, and I try to relate all the other ones to, as far as parameters, is pressure. And you can think of pressure as a result of constant collisions between other gas particles and the surfaces around them, okay? So you can think of, here we have gas molecules. So let's, let's say they're in a container. And when they collide with this container, right, that collision exerts a force on the walls of the container, okay? So that's essentially what pressure is. It's force per unit area, okay? So if I had a balloon, and, and you can think of it, because a lot of times people don't, uh, when they explain pressure in textbooks, they use pistons, and a lot of people can't really relate to engine pistons. So I tell students, okay, think of a balloon, right? If I have a balloon, right? And there's gas particles in this balloon, okay? These gas particles are flying around and you could take one inch by one inch of that surface of that balloon. And every time a gas particle collides with that, you exert a force. And that force can be measured in pounds. And that force can be measured in pounds per square inch, other no, otherwise known as PSI. So if you look at any of your tires, you have to measure the PSI. That's because the gas particles in the tire are colliding in a square inch, pounds per square inch. So why is you know, gas pressure that we should be comfortable with and something we can relate to? So it's a cumulative force of many collisions on the walls of the container. So here I have, you may have heard these terms with weather, a low pressure front, front a high pressure front. Well, that has to do with the number of collisions. So in this top example of a lower pressure front, we have fewer particles. So the reason why there's a lower pressure when there's fewer particles is there's fewer collisions, okay? So with a low pressure front, you have less moisture in the air, you have fewer collisions, less pressure. In a high pressure front, there's more particles. There's more, let's say, water vapor in the air. And as a result, there's more collisions. Well, if there's more collisions on the walls of the container, there's more force being exerted per unit area. So really, how I want you to think of pressure, this is, it, it just helps, I think, all students, is I want you to think pressures are directly proportional to the number of collisions. Okay, so if anything increases the number of collisions, pressure will go up. So in this example, more gas particles, more collisions, higher pressure. With that being said, let's continue. So what are the units of pressure? So we have atmospheric, which is the average pressure at sea level. Another common unit is millimeters of mercury. So mercury is a liquid at room temperature. And where this originates from is how, measure, uh, how we measure pressure with a barometer. You can think of a barometer as a long tube with an open end, okay? So you can essentially have a long tube, fill it up with liquid mercury, invert it in a pool of mercury. And we know that because of gravity, it's going to drop, but there's gonna be a vacuum in here that prevents it from completely flowing out. But there's another, factor 
that influences why the barometer maintains a level of mercury in it is atmospheric pressure. So you may have heard of the concept for every force there's an equal and opposite force. So we have the pressure of a gas or the liquid mercury trying to push down, but outside above the pool of mercury is a bunch of atmospheric pressure. We have gas particles and the gas particles are colliding with this pool of mercury. Okay, so we measure the pressure of the atmosphere based on the distance that the liquid mercury drops in this barometer. So when you measure that distance, and if it's at sea level, at normal atmospheric pressure, you'll notice that it's 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so you could take the measurement from the top of the pool to the meniscus of the uh, mercury barometer. Now, if you're lucky, you might still have a mercury barometer somewhere in one of your labs. Nowadays, we use a lot of just plug-in barometers. You can easily do that or people go online and figure out atmospheric pressure. If you're here in the US, you're gonna notice when you watch the weather and they talk about barometric pressure, the units are gonna be in inches because we don't use the metric system. But for my course, we're gonna be focusing on millimeters of mercury because we're using the metric system. So we're gonna treat one atmosphere as exactly 760 millimeters of mercury. So we're never gonna use this for sig fig purposes. So if we're ever doing a conversion factor between atmospheres and millimeters of mercury, we are not gonna use significance figures because we're treating this as an exact measurement that has infinite sig figs because there is no reasonable doubt. We're treating it as exact. The other thing is the person who came up with this concept is Torricelli. And as respect, we say that one millimeter of mercury is equivalent to one tor. So we could also say that one atmosphere, which is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, is 760 tor. Because one millimeter of mercury is one tor. So there's more. Right, I had earlier said we could do inches of mercury, which is what in the United States, the weather, when we see the weather on the news, they do barometric pressures of barometric pressure in inches. There's pounds per square inch, so 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's again for tire inflation, footballs, things like that. There's Pascal and kilopascal, all very useful um, in other courses. For this course, our focus is basically one atmosphere, 760 millimeters of mercury, which is equivalent to 760 tor. So you really only need to worry about kind of one conversion factor. The other ones would be provided for you. So let's perform some practice pressure unit conversion so that we're comfortable, okay? So again, one atmosphere, is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, which is equivalent to 760 tor. So can I convert 575 tor to atmosphere? Well, I can use this as a conversion factor and I could start with my 575 tor I'm using one atmosphere, 760 tor. I want the unit of tor to cancel, so I put it in the denominator. I see that it cancels, and I'm left with ATM as my unit. And when I divide 575 by 760, I get 0 0.757 atmosphere. Now, the reason why this is three significant figures is I started in the problem with three sig figs, and I'm treating the conversion factor as an exact number. Can I convert atmosphere to millimeters of mercury? Sure, I can just take this conversion factor and flip it. And remember, tor and millimeters of mercury are equivalent. So I start with 2.17 ATM. I want the unit of ATM on the bottom. I use a conversion factor. There's 760 millimeters of mercury per one ATM. I ATM cancel. I'm left with millimeters of mercury. I have three sig figs with my starting calculation and my starting numbers. So I end with three sig figs and my unit is millimeters of mercury.
So that is a very easy way for us if we're giving units in pressure in either atmosphere of tor or millimeters of mercury to go into other units. But now let's look at the other parameters, volume, temperature, and how they can affect, and later we'll do moles as well, but how they can affect pressure. So the three variables we're gonna look at are the volume of the container, the temperature of the gas, and the number of molecules and how it affects pressure. And again, I want you to think as pressure being directly proportional to the number of collisions, okay? So we can have a open J-hook tube, okay? So a J-hook tube is exactly what it looks like. It's a tube that has an open end, and then it has a closed end, and it looks like the letter J, okay? And before I put anything in here, there is gonna be gas trapped in this J-hook tube. Well, then I can pour mercury into it, and what I'll notice is that the gas in here will have a certain height relative to the gas outside, okay? If I add more mercury, right? If I'm adding more mercury, it's gonna squeeze that gas because it's applying more pounds of pressure, okay? So what happens is I notice that the volume actually now begins to decrease based on the height difference. And then I can measure, okay? And plot my data with volume as the dependent variable, right? Because whenever you have like y equals slope times x plus the y-intercept, let's say, the pressure is independent and the y is dependent. And what I'm noticing is as pressure increases, the y volume decreases. And I see that slope right here. And it's not linear, okay? It's not linear. So we see, but it is related. And how is it related? Well, it's basically inversely proportional. So when we look at volume versus pressure, when volume decreases, the gas molecules have less room to collide. So remember what I said, pressure is directly proportional to the number of collisions. So if I increase volume, so here I have, a piston, okay? If I lower the piston, right? If I lower the piston and make this shorter, the volume decreases. Now there's less room in the piston per square inch. I could take a square inch. There's gonna be more collisions. If I increase the volume, then there's more room for the particles to collide. So then I have less pressure. I like to say, all right, people don't like pistons. They like balloons, right? So here's a balloon. There's a certain number of collisions per square inch. If I take that balloon and I decrease the volume, but I have the same number of particles, now there's less room. So the collisions are gonna increase per square inch because there's less room for them to travel. So as I decrease volume, pressure increases. If I take the same balloon with the same number of particles at the same temperature and I increase the volume, but I have the same number of particles, right? So now there's more room so now the number of collisions per square inch decreases because I've just added more area for it to travel to reach that square inch of the wall of the container. So now if I increase volume, the number of collisions decrease, so my pressure decreases. I don't know. I think people like balloons better. Well, what about temperature? Okay, so we talked about volume. Also with volume, I want you to think, there's those like stress toys. I don't know if you guys have ever seen those where when you apply pressure and you squeeze them, the volume of the stress toy goes down. So you can kind of think of that. If you increase pressure, volume decreases, okay? But let's think of temperature. 
right? So if temperature decreases, right? So I keep the volume constant. I keep the number of particles, but now I decrease temperature. These particles are gonna move slower. So if the particles are moving slower, then what happens to the number of collisions? The number of collisions goes down because they're not traveling as fast and there won't be as many collisions. So what, what I'm noticing is if I decrease temperature, pressure also decreases. So that would mean they're directly proportional. On the other hand, you know, if I heat this up, if I take this container, right? It has a constant volume and a constant number of particles, but now I heat it up. Now the particles are moving faster, right? So there's more collisions, so pressure will increase. So if I increase temperature, there'll be increased pressure. That's why with closed containers, you don't wanna heat them up because what'll happen is there'll be, the particles will move faster and they'll want to collide with the container more to expand it, but if it's confined, it'll explode. Well, what about the moles? If I increase the number of particles, so if I maintain a constant volume and a constant temperature and I take out some of the gas, well, what happens? Fewer particles, fewer collisions. So pressure would decrease. So pressure decreases when I decrease the number of moles. Well, what happens if I add more gas? Okay, so again, I have the same volume, same temperature, but now I add more gas in that fixed volume and temperature. Well, if I add more gas, if I add more moles, there's gonna be more collisions, pressure will increase. So again, when you think of pressure, think of how does it relate to the number of collisions? Whatever you're doing to it, if it increases the number of collisions, there's more pressure. If it decreases the number of collisions, there'll be less. That's what Boyle's law is. So Boyle's law is the first law that we talk about. And it basically states that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. What does that mean? Well, inversely proportional means is if one goes up, the other goes down. So let's say I have a piston, okay? And I have a fixed amount of gas at a fixed temperature and my volume is four liters. If I decrease the volume to two liters, right? Now the atmosphere, so I have the volume, will double. So why? There's half the room for these particles to collide. So because there's half the available room in the container, I double the number of collisions. If I double the number of collisions, then my pressure doubles. So that's why we write this as inversely proportional, okay? So if, you know, if volume decreases, then pressure will increase. Okay, so really there has to be this proportionality constant to make this proportionality equal. So we'll just say for now it's K, okay? So now this proportionality that I had as volume is inversely proportional to pressure, now I gotta set it equal, so I add a constant. Now if I want to, I can solve for this constant. And I end up getting pressure times volume is equal to some constant if I have constant temperature and moles. So if pressure and volume at constant temperature and moles is always equal to some constant value, then under any conditions, whether they be initial or final, it's always equal to that. And what I notice is I can set it equal to the constant, but I can remove that constant and just set them equal to each other. And that's what that last slide showed, is if I had four liters and this was one ATM, right? This is my initial set of conditions. What would happen if I decreased the volume to two liters? 
what would happen to P2? Well, it would have to equal the one times four. So what number times two is gonna give me four? Two, and that's why the pressure doubled to two atmospheres. So if I decrease this, this will have to increase to equal this. It's like basically saying four times one equals two times two because it's equal to a constant. Now you might remember that first equation that I wrote, which we haven't even talked about yet, was PV equals nRT. And I said, if you solve for R, you get PV over NT, and that equals a constant, R. If I always set this quotient PV over NT equals PV over NT, I can do the same thing. I could put initial conditions, and I could put final conditions. And if moles and temperature are constant, let's just say one mole, one Kelvin, the bottom here, the denominator in this first quotient would just be one. And if it's one mole and one Kelvin, because it's always constant, it would be one as well. So these basically just cancel each other out. So when I'm only dealing with pressure and volume changes, I get Boyle's law, which is this. P1 V1 equals P2 V2. But by knowing the ideal gas law, which we haven't talked about yet, you'll see algebraically you can manipulate it using that little trick I showed you. If you don't get it right now, it's okay. There's still more to come. I thought this was kind of neat. This was uh, the data presented from Boyle um, on his findings for um, pressure and volume. So I thought that was kind of cool to see that. Very meticulous. He used fractions too, which is even you know more old school and impressive. Okay. What I want to do though is I actually want to practice using Boyle's law. So. What is Boyle's law? Well, I'll just rewrite it so we're comfortable. And again, I'll show you how you can derive it in the future, but we'll write P1 V1 equals P2 V2, okay? So when I'm reading this, a 1.5 liter sample of methane gas exerts a pressure of 1650 millimeters of mercury. What is the final pressure if the volume changes to seven liters? Okay. The one stand for initial. When I read this, a 1.5 liter, that's the initial volume, because liters is volumetric. Sample of a gas exerts a pressure of this. So if this is my initial volume, this is my initial pressure. What is the final pressure? So I've changed the conditions to get new conditions. So what am I changing? I'm changing the volume from one. 0.5 liters to 7 liters. That's my V2. So what am I looking for? My P2. So I'm looking for P2. So I can rearrange P1V1 equals P2V2 by dividing both sides by V2. And I'm left with P2 equals P1, I just separated it here, over V1, V2, V1, V2. And now it's just a question of plugging in the information. My initial pressure of 1650 millimeters of mercury, and then my um, initial volume was 1.50 liters, and I divide it by 7.00 liters, which was my final volume. And I'm left with the liters canceling, units of millimeters of mercury, and three sig figs. Why three sig figs? Well, every number in this problem, every single number in the problem has three sig figs, right? So this is three sig figs because that zero is a trailing zero with a decimal, so it counts. This is a trailing zero without a decimal, so it does not count, so this is three sig figs. And these are two trailing zeros, but with the decimal, so they both count, so three sig figs, okay? So what we noticed is 
and it goes, I can do the little balloons, but we had a gas that had a certain volume. When we increase the volume, the pressure decreased. So when volume increased, pressure decreased. How do I know? Well, initially my volume was what? 1.50 liters. My pressure was the 1650 millimeters of mercury. What happened here? I made the volume much bigger, seven liters. So doesn't it make sense that now that there's more room, there's fewer collisions per unit area, so now my new pressure is only 354 millimeters of mercury. It's just a ratio and they're inversely proportional. So if you need a pause, go ahead, but we're gonna solve this problem for sample exercise number one. So for exercise number one, if a sample of helium gas has a volume of 120 mils. So in my head, this is the first volume I'm reading. V1, and a pressure of 850 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so the 120 mils, which is the first volume, has this first pressure. What is the new volume? So I must be looking for V2 if the pressure is changed to 425 millimeters of mercury. Well, that must be my new pressure. So I've changed the pressure from 850 to 425 millimeters of mercury. How is that going to change the 120 mils? Well, that's why we need Boyle's law. P1, V1 equals P2, V2. I must solve for what? V2, because what is the new volume? So I'm going to rearrange this, and I'm going to get, sorry, I jumped. V2, I'm going to divide both sides by P2. V2 is going to equal... P1V1 over P2. So I just rearranged it here in the solution to show that I like to put the P1 and the P2 over each other so that we can see that the units cancel and I'm left with units of milliliters, which is a volumetric unit, which is what I want because, you know, that was what volume one was in. And when I plug it in, and you know, you could plug it in just like I did here. So I go 850 milliliters of mercury, 120 mils. So I'm just taking this and this, and I'm multiplying them. And now what am I going to do? I'm going to divide by the 425 millimeters of mercury. And that unit cancels and I'm left with mills. Okay. If you prefer, you could, you don't have to rearrange it. If you prefer, you, you don't have to. Like some students don't like rearranging things algebraically. They just don't. And that's okay. If you prefer not to, don't. Just plug it in directly. Then you would go, all right, P1 is 850 millimeters of mercury. V1 is 120 mils. P2 is 425 millimeters of mercury. And I'm looking for V2. And then you would see, okay, I have to divide by 425 millimeters of mercury to cancel it. So this cancels and I'm up with V2. And that's why we see this quotient right here. Okay. And we get two sig figs. Why two sig figs? Well, my V1. The 120 has a trailing zero without a decimal, so it's only two sig figs. So this answer has to be two sig figs. Okay, so that's Boyle's law. Well, there's more laws, but it's okay. We're gonna understand everything as best we can. So Charles' law has to do with volume. And when we think of kinetic molecular theory, we think of movement, temperature. So typically, if I have a balloon, it's going to expand a certain amount based on, you may remember me saying, for every, you know, force, there's an equal and opposite force. So you have to understand with balloons, the reason why they stop expanding eventually is there is atmospheric pressure, right? So there's particles outside of the balloon, 
that are colliding with the walls of the container, trying to squeeze it in. But inside, the gas particles are colliding with equal and opposite force to expand. So eventually, the gas inside and the gas outside the atmospheric are going to be equal, so it will stop expanding. All right. So what happens if I take a balloon and I put it in really cold water? Well, now the gas particles are moving slower. So when they move slower, there's less collisions. So what does that mean? That means the pressure of the gas is going to go down. So then the atmospheric pressure is going to squeeze this in more. Okay, so what we're looking at when we talk about Charles' law is actually the volume and the temperature. If I decrease the temperature, the volume will decrease. Why? Because there's fewer collisions inside and the atmospheric pressure is going to squeeze it because it's stronger. Well, what happens if I increase temperature? It's the opposite. Now inside, the pressure of the gas goes up because as I heat it up, the particles are moving faster and they're colliding. And when they collide more frequently, they're gonna push and expand the balloon until it equals with the atmospheric pressure. You may have seen this if you ever see hot air balloons, right? When they get too low or they want them to go up, they add the heat that expands it and makes it less dense so that it can go above and higher because now it's spread out more and less dense than um, air. So what we're seeing is if I increase temperature, now the volume increases because the gas inside is pushing back at the atmosphere until it equalizes because atmospheric pressure is constant. That doesn't change. The only pressure that's changing is the gas inside the balloon. So if it's a constant pressure, the gas will either expand or contract to equalize with atmospheric pressure. So we see changes in volumes, essentially. So in Charles' discovery, he saw that volume is directly proportional to temperature. Now, what's unique with Charles' law is we are going to use the absolute temperature scale of Kelvin. So this works with units of Kelvin. It does not work with Celsius or Fahrenheit, okay? So you're gonna have to always change whenever there's temperature in any of these gas laws to Kelvin. But what he noticed is if I increase the temperature, right, I'm gonna end up increasing the volume. So why is that? Again, the atmospheric pressure in here outside of this piston is constant. But if I heat this up, they're going to move faster and they're going to push this back. So it's going to equalize when it expands. And now the number of collisions inside are the same as they were prior. And the only way, if you're speeding up the particles for the number of collisions to be equal to when they were moving slower, is to create greater distance so it takes longer for them to hit the container. So what we're noticing is they're directly proportional. If I increase temperature, volume increases at constant pressure. So key here, it has to be Kelvin. And the reason is when you actually plot the data, so you know what Charles actually did was he recorded volume changes, right? So he's basically wondering how is volume affected by increases in temperature? So he increased the temperature on a degree Celsius scale and plot his points. And he noticed that volume increase. So it's directly proportional. And we see that it's linear too, okay? It's a positive linear slope. But what he did was he wondered, okay, well, all this data, here's my range, here's my high, here's my low. I can interpolate, but if I extend the line, I can extrapolate some information. And what he noticed is not the y-intercept, because we always think of, you know, y equals mx plus b. We always look at the y-intercept. The x-intercept tells us something very important. The x-intercept, to get the x-intercept, you make y equal to zero, right? So 
What he noticed at the x-intercept where volume would be zero, which we know is not going to happen, right? It's a theoretical because the gas particles are going to have volume. But theoretically, he came up with an absolute scale that I could start at zero. What he noticed is at the x-intercept, right, it was negative 273.15, actually, <laughs> degrees Celsius. And he said, that's going to be pretty much an absolute zero. So we're going to say that's zero, the starting scale. Basically, we're just sliding everything 273.15 degrees. That's going to be zero Kelvin. So that's what the graph shows us. So zero is negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. You may remember when we were first learning in chapter two for temperature, right? that Fahrenheit was equal to the 1.8. So degrees Fahrenheit is 1.8 times degrees Celsius plus 32. And that the Celsius or the Kelvin was equal to your degree Celsius plus 273.15. Why? Well, if I add to the Kelvin negative 273.15, why am I picking that? Again, on that curve, that was the x-intercept. And now I add 273.15, I get the zero. So that's why it's considered the absolute temperature scale. We're making that x-intercept where there would be no volume, which we're not gonna reach, as absolute zero. So again, what Charles is noticing is, as we increase temperature, volume increases. So we need a proportionality constant. So if I have constant moles, constant pressure, I can rearrange to solve for that constant, and I get V over T. Well, if volume over temperature is always constant, then I could have an initial set of conditions and I could have a final set of conditions, and they're still equal to that constant as long as pressure and moles are constant. So we can just set them equal to each other. Now again, remember, PV equals NRT, right? If we rearrange it for the constant R, we get PV over NT always equals PV over NT. Well, if pressure is constant, according to Charles, let's just say one atmosphere, one and one would cancel. Let's say we had one mole of the gas. The one mole and the one mole will cancel. What would we get? V over T equals R, which equals this V over T. So initial, final. Charles law, derived from the ideal gas law. It's actually the other way around. We use Boyle's, Charles, Gay-Lussac's, and Avogadro's law to derive the ideal gas law, but we're taking the luxury of hundreds of years of development in these gas laws and just say, look, we know the ideal gas law. Let's make it easy on ourselves and rearrange them for these earlier laws that helped us develop the gas law, the ideal gas law. So here's a Charles law problem. I have 275 liters of helium. I know that this must be my initial volume. The balloon is heated from 20 degrees Celsius to 40. Okay, so that must mean that this was my initial temperature. This is my final temperature. What is the final volume? I must be looking for V2 at constant pressure. So the first thing is, if you ever have temperature, okay, if you ever have temperature, you have to convert it to Kelvin. Now, really what this problem should have done because you don't want to just go to the tens. You want to at least go to the ones. There's shit. I'm going to correct this and put a decimal here to let you know that I want you to go to the ones. Okay. So if I was to have, you know, 20 plus the 273.15, if I would go to the tens only, oops, I didn't align this good. I'm sorry. I'm being messy. If I have 273.15 and I add 20 and there was no decimal, 
it would go 293.15, but I would have to stop at the tens. So my final answer, because this is three, would just be 290. But I want to go to the ones. So I'm putting a decimal here so that I go here. And now it's 293. And I'm doing the same here. It's 313. Okay. So for this problem, I know that I'm using Charles Law. And with Charles Law, we know that V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. What am I looking for? Final volume. How do I get that? I need to multiply both sides by T2. And when I do that, that cancels. And I can rearrange this to have T2 over T1 right here. This is like over one. That way the units cancel. And then all that would be left would be my V1. Okay. If you don't want to do that, you can just plug it in directly with the numbers and then solve. But I'm going to do it. So my V1 was 275 liters. My T2 is the 40 degrees Celsius, which I changed to 313 Kelvin. And my T1 is the 293 Kelvin. And that goes on the bottom. And I notice that the Kelvin cancel, and I'm left with liters. And the reason why this is three sig figs, because a lot of people get confused, because even, right, this is three sig figs, and this looks like it's only two, but what are we doing now? We're using not just multiplication and division rules for sig figs, we're using addition subtraction. I added the decimal to bring it to the tenths. So 273 plus 40 is 313, or not to the tenths, to the ones. That's the ones. 20 point or 20 with a decimal brings it to the ones plus 273 is 293. So these actually have three sig figs now. And you can have that when you do addition and subtraction, you could have the number of sig figs go up or down based on the precision. That's actually really common. So that's why our final answer has three sig figs. So now let's have you try it. So you, you can pause this recording and work this problem out. I'm gonna assume you paused and I'm gonna just work it out. So are they gonna always tell you solve the following problem using Charles Law? No, they are not. So that's not gonna happen. That's why I'm showing you, you know, PV equals NRT. I solve for R and I get PV over NT equals R, which is a constant, but it always equals that. So I could put my one, 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 two, 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 two. And now when I read the problem, a balloon has a volume of 785 mils. That must be my V1. At 21 degrees Celsius, that must be my T1. If the temperature drops to zero degrees Celsius, T2, what is the new volume? V2, assume constant, P. So P and moles weren't even mentioned. Well, I guess pressure was, it's constant. If they don't measure, mention moles, assume it's going to be constant. So we're only dealing with the V and the T, and that's Charles' law. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. So V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. However, if you look, your T2 is zero. If you put a zero here, you're gonna get an undefined number because any number divided by zero, put it in a calculator, it won't work. So right off the bat, you have to remember always, always, always with all gas laws, you have to convert temperature, whatever it is, if it's Fahrenheit or Celsius, you have to convert it to Kelvin. So my T1 is 21 degrees Celsius, so I'm going right there. Now, even if I had the 0.15 here, okay, I would end up getting, if I added the 21, 294.15. If I only go to the ones, I would stop here. The one, I would just drop it, and I get 294, okay? 
Whoops, sorry about that. I was trying to erase that. So now I got to do the same thing for T2. And what we notice with T2 is 0 plus 273 gives me the 273 Kelvin. So now I won't put a 0 in here. And now I need to solve for V2. So you could rearrange this algebraically or plug and chug. I like to rearrange algebraically, which means I'm going to multiply both sides by T2. And on this side, it'll cancel. So I end up getting V2 equals V1 over T1 times T2. And now I just plug everything in. V1 is 785 mils. T2 is 273 Kelvin. T1 was 294. The Kelvins cancel. So I'm left with the units of milliliters. 785 multiplied by 273 divided by 294 gives me 729, which makes sense. Right, So I decreased temperature. So as temperature decreased, so did the volume. Two, 729 mils. And it's three sig figs for my spinal answer. There's another law, and that's Gay-Lussac, which discovered that pressure of gas is directly proportional to Kelvin. So if I have a constant volume, and now I heat this gas up, everything's moving faster. There's more collisions. More collisions per container, more force per area, pressure goes up. So if I double the heat, I'm going to double the pressure. Why? They're directly proportional. If one goes up, so does the other. What's temperature going to always be when we deal with gas laws, whether it's Charles or Gay-Lussac's? Kelvin. So P1 over T1 equals P2 over V2. We could derive that again earlier. I said, you know, P1, V1 over N1, T1 equals P2, V2 over N2, T2. That was derived from PV equals NRT. And we solved for the constant PV over NT equals a constant, and if it's always constant, then I can change the parameters. If volume and moles are constant, volumes one, we'll say liter, and moles is one mole, we end up getting P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2, which is K X. So let's just go. I mean, now we're getting solid. Let's just pause this. Remember, gay lussac how do I know? I have a sample of gas at this pressure. So that must be an initial. In a steel tank, and it goes from this temperature to this temperature. That's my T2. What is the final pressure? That is my P2. So, and they're saying millimeters of mercury. So you're going to leave it in millimeters of mercury. So what do I do? P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. I'm solving for. P2. So I can multiply both sides by T2. I have to first convert both temperatures that are in Celsius to Kelvin. So 500 degrees Celsius. Now notice this time I went to the tenths. So if I go to the tenths, I have to go to the tenths here. So someone might say, well, why is it point 0.2? Well, if I add 273.15. I'm going to end up getting 773.15, but I'm going to the tenths because this measurements to the tenths. This I treat as exact. I treat that as exact. Okay. I don't use that for sig fig purposes. I use my measurement, and my measurement of 500.0 goes to the tenths. So my answer goes to the tenths. But when I look at seven, 113.15, the five causes me to round this up to a two. Okay, so you have to be able to remember this. You're using addition, subtraction formula. Okay, so now T2 to zero at 273.15. So I go to the tenths. Oh, well, actually, you know what? On this one, I should be going to the hundreds. Here's a typo. Should be going to the hundreds. I'm, I'm, see, 
Teachers make mistakes. I should be going to the 100. So that's 273.15 Kelvin. And I'm putting it on there. It won't change my final answer. You'll see. Okay. And then my pressure is three sig figs, 3.0 times 10 to the 3 millimeters of mercury. So I'm going to plug everything in. And I'm going to get 3.00 times 10 to the 3 millimeters of mercury. This would actually be 273.15. It would. <laughs> divided by 773.2. So for sig fig purposes, in this quotient, I have 273.15. This is actually five sig figs. In this, in this denominator of the quotient, I have four sig figs. But I'm multiplying them by three sig figs. So now I have to use the rules of multiplication and division. So this is three sig figs. So my answer has to have three sig figs. So the one zero six are significant because this middle zero is a captive and counts. This trailing zero does not count because there's no decimal. So my final answer is 1060 millimeters of mercury. So basically what have we talked about? We talked about boils where if there's an increase in volume, there's a decrease in pressure. Just think, right? If I expand a balloon, there's less collisions per unit area, area so the pressure is going to decrease, right? If I decrease volume, the pressure is going to increase. Think of a, to, to decrease volume, I'm going to have to apply pressure and increase pressure. Then Charles, right? Volume's going to go up, if I speed the temperature, right? If I increase the temperature and it's colliding more, it's gonna push out to keep that constant pressure. So if I increase temperature, volume is gonna increase. That was Charles. And Gay Luzak says, well, if I have a constant volume, right? So if the atmospheric pressure or, or doesn't matter what that is, inside the container, I just have a fixed volume. So it, that piston's not left to be, you know, flexible, it doesn't move, it's fixed. And now I increase the temperature. Think of like hairspray in an aquanet, right? You got a certain number of particles and it's a fixed volume. If I put that over heat, now what's gonna happen? Everything's moving faster, there's more collisions. Hey, too much heat, it'll explode, okay? So what I'm noticing is that all three of these, okay? I'm, I'm starting to see this ratio. So here's, here's Boyles. Here's Charles. Here's Gay Luzak. Well, why not just put them all together? Let's, let's make it a lot easier on ourselves. If we have temperature, pressure, and volume, right, we can still change the parameters and still solve for them. How come? I combine all. So P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. I'm basically taking that PV equals NRT, solving for R, and we're assuming that the moles are always constant. So we're only dealing with pressure, volume, and temperature, right? And if they're always equal to a constant, Let's just say we add one mole, we get this, the combined gas. So let's apply the combined gas to 10 liters of carbon dioxide at 300 Kelvin in one atmosphere. So this must be what? V1. This is my T1. That decimal means I go to the ones place. This is my P1. If the volume and uh, Kelvin temperature double, what is the new pressure? So now, if I double this, what happens? Well, let's figure that out. Let's look at the parameters, right? We started with one atmosphere, 10 liters, 300 Kelvin, but now we're doubling it. So I'm solving for P2. So remember, P1V1 over T1 
equals P2 V2 over T2. How do I solve for P2? I'm multiplying both sides to get rid of this right here. I have to multiply both sides by T2 over V2. T2 over V2. So on this side, that cancels and that. And I'm left with T2 in the numerator. Here's T2. T1 in the denominator. T1 in the denominator. V1 in the numerator. V2 in the denominator. And then P1. That's going to give me my units. So I started with one atmosphere, right? 10 liters, 300 Kelvin. But then I doubled the temperature to 600 Kelvin. And I doubled the volume to 20 liters. I end up getting the same, right? So I end up getting the same. So you can still do that. Let's try one that's a little bit trickier, right? It's not these perfect double, double, right? And the reason why this worked out is, remember, I doubled this. I doubled the temperature, but I also doubled the volume. So this ratio right here, one over two, took care of this two over one ratio. But you don't need to worry about that. You can just plug it directly in. So a sample of gas has an initial volume of what? 158 mils. That must be my V1. At a pressure of, this must be my P1. And a temperature of 34, this must be my T1. If the gas is compressed to a volume of 108 mils, so now I'm decreasing this, so there's a change, this is my V2, and heated to a temperature of T2, what is the final pressure? I'm looking for P2. So what are we gonna use? We have all three parameters, pressure, volume, temperature, so I'm using the combined gas law. P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2, and I'm solving for P2. Okay, just like I did earlier. So I rearranged it. How did I do that? I multiplied both sides by T2 over V2. This cancels in this, which leaves me just the P2. I notice on this side the T2 is over the T1. T2 over the T1. And the V1 is over the V2, and then I just plug my P1. So the temperatures have to be changed to Kelvin. So I'm adding 273. Again, you're really adding 273.15, but I just stopped because I know that I go to the ones only. So it's just going to be 307 and 358. Okay. If you're confused with that, again, 273.15 plus 34, I get the 15 and I get the 307. If I go to the ones only, I drop the 0.15. It's the same for T2. So now I'm gonna plug everything in. So for P1, 735 millimeters of mercury, then for my V1, 158 mils. For my T2, 358 Kelvin. It has to be in Kelvin. For my T1, 307 Kelvin. And then for my V2 on the bottom, 108. All the units are going to cancel. Mills, Kelvin, except the unit for pressure, millimeters of mercury. And I'm going to have, for all of these, have three sig figs. So my final answer is three. It's a big number. It's 1.25 times 10 to the three millimeters of mercury. Okay. So notice when I'm writing this out, I am rearranging the formula algebraically. You do not have to do that. You can just plug it in directly. That is okay. I'm doing that because I like... It's just cleaner for me. Um, if you don't want to, you can still plug everything in and still get the same answer. Okay. 
So if you want to go directly in here, you have everything lined up. You always have to change Celsius. So we've done that, all right? So if you ignore rearrangement, right, we're still going to have to do this portion right here, okay? So now if I plug in, what's my P1? 735 millimeters of mercury. What's my V1? 158 milliliters divided by my T1, 34 plus 273, 307 Kelvin, equals P2 is what I'm looking for, V2, 108 mils, and then T2, 358 Kelvin. So you're, you're going to see now, you know, you could, you can do this quotient and then divide it by both sides, but you see the 358 to get rid of it on the denominator, I have to multiply both sides by 358. That's why it's on top. And that's good because it helps me cancel out the Kelvin for the 307 that's on the bottom. And then to get rid of this 108, I have to divide both sides by 108. That's why it's on the bottom over here. And that's good because it helps me cancel out the mills for the V1. And I'll get the same exact answer. So either way is fine. Again, I like rearranging things algebraically. I'm comfortable with it. If you're not, don't do it. So this is kind of a little off shoot, but basically above any liquid, and this is what it doesn't even, it doesn't have to just be closed, but above any liquid, there is pressure, there's a vapor pressure. So as liquid either evaporates or boils, we have to realize we have a liquid and then for it to escape into a gas, right? We learned this with the different states of matter using Q equals MCAT and we talked about that. But if we're escaping to a gas, that means there's pressure above a liquid because there's gas particles. And all pressure is, is force per unit area. So there's always vapor pressure over any liquid, whether it's a closed container or not, okay? And it's at any temperature. As the temperature increases, there's more vaporization, meaning now the particles, as temperature increases, there's more particles moving faster if they're at the surface, it's easier for them to escape the intermolecular forces that holds them down in the bulk of the solution because they can reach what's called that escape velocity. That's why as temperature increases, what do we notice about lakes and rivers? They start to recede, right? Because now the bulk of the liquid's moving faster, so more of it can escape to a vapor phase. So they start to recede and they lose the bulk liquid because they're escaping because they're moving fast enough to reach the escape velocity and become a gas. And when they become a gas, that means above that liquid, there's more gases, there's a greater vapor pressure. A boiling is just when the vapor pressure reaches atmospheric pressure. So the boiling point of water, well, it depends on, you know, atmospheric pressure, basically the vapor pressure, but typically, what we say is one atmosphere of pressure, which is 760 millimeters of mercury, right? This is the standard. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. That is the normal boiling point. The normal boiling point for water is 100 degrees Celsius, but that's only at one atmosphere of pressure. At lower or higher altitudes, that can change. So at a higher altitude, let's say I'm trying to boil water on a hill. Well, because of gravity, the atmosphere pressure is greater closer to the sea level because more particles are being pulled down. At higher altitudes, there's fewer particles above that liquid. So because there's fewer particles pushing down, the vapor pressure, right, the force, remember we were talking about equal just opposite directions. To push away the atmosphere, the vapor or the liquid 
requires less pressure now because at a higher altitude, there's less pressure. So when the vapor pressure at a higher altitude goes down, let's say the vapor pressure is only 355 millimeters of mercury, half the water can boil at 80 degrees Celsius because there's less that I need to push back out and escape. Okay, so that's kind of a side note to go with, you know, we were just talking about increases in temperature and pressure. So I, with Gay Luzax, so I kind of tied that in. Um, yeah. So we have that combined gas law. And the next lecture, we're going to use the combined gas law to get to the ideal gas law, which is PV equals NRT. And the combined gas, if you remember, is the P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. So there's three variables here, pressure, volume, temperature. We need one more parameter, and that's moles. And the road to get to the ideal gas law required moles and another law, and that's what we'll be talking about for next lecture when we continue this discussion of the gas laws in chapter eight. So thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, and let me know if you have any questions. We'll continue this discussion uh, with the next lecture.